So you're getting a pool installed or you want to have a swimming pool installed. Let me help you with that process. There's a number of things that I'd like to talk to you about, about the whole pool buying and installing process that I think could help to demystify a couple of things, help you to get more value for your money and protect your interests a little bit when you're going through this process. Buying a swimming pool, as, as reported by people who have gone through the processes, can be a negative experience. And it's certainly something that you want to avoid. Like swimming pools are crazy expensive. If I were going to spend this kind of money and have something like this installed for my enjoyment, I want that to be a good experience. I do not want to spend that kind of money and have a negative experience, period. I don't care what we're talking about, swimming pool, sports car, vacation, or otherwise. So what can you do to protect your interests as a homeowner who is thinking to have a swimming pool installed? Well, the first thing is going to be some pretty basic advice. You need to get three estimates for the swimming pool. And you're thinking, yeah, of course, I'm going to get some estimates, whatever. No, I said you need to get three estimates. And I'm saying that as the minimum number, and here's why. You get, first of all, it's hard to get estimates. You think it's easy. You send out six, you know, requests for estimates, you know, thinking that they're going to be jumping at the opportunity to take your money. And maybe one of the six even returns your inquiry and you're like, oh, what the heck? And that's kind of how the swimming pool industry works especially if you start shopping at a really busy time of year. So you need three quotes. And why do you need those three quotes? Well, the first one was $150,000. And if it was hard to get more quotes, you might be inclined to think, I don't know, this person seemed all right. Like, should we do it? No, what if, what if you get another quote from another person and it's $100,000? And line for line, item for item, it's the exact same swimming pool. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm worried about any price that's too low, but I, I certainly don't want to overpay by $50,000 for something that I could get the exact same thing for cheaper. And that's why you need three quotes, because the, by the time you get the third quote, if there's an odd duck out here, one of these numbers is not in line with the rest of them. Okay, th those are major red flags when it comes to swimming pool installations. And maybe just to touch on that, just so you're aware as a, as a homeowner looking for a swimming pool, largely the pool building industry is unregulated. And by that I mean there's not trade certification like a plumber or an electrician or anything like that. And in a lot of areas you don't even need like a license or general contractor's license, really anything at all. You got a hat that says pool builder on it, guess what? You're licensed to give estimates and build swimming pools and not everybody has the requisite experience and skills to do such a thing because, as it turns out, building a swimming pool is actually an appreciably hard thing to do from a technical perspective. I often compare it to building a home. It's a very similar process, actually, to building a home. There's a, all the different trades that are involved from concrete and plumbers and electricians and gas fitters and all. Doesn't that sound like building a home? Well, it's a pretty similar process overall. Perhaps the size and scope are a little bit different, but in some ways it's even more challenging. Like you're creating this structure which is going to retain water, which is very hard to do, and it's going to be chemically sterile. Like that's also very hard to do. The whole thing is actually very hard to do. So if you get underskilled or underexperienced people building your swimming pool, it's not that it could go wrong or it might not, you know, be as good. You can pretty much count on it's going to go wrong or it's not going to be as good. You want a good pool builder and that's why you need to get a bunch of estimates when you're thinking about getting a pool built. When you're getting these estimates, what you want to attempt to achieve is an apples to apples comparison. Sounds easy, not easy to do. First of all, you will have dealers which only sell and install Pentair equipment and other dealers which only install, install Hayward equipment. And so right away, you can't really directly compare the quotes. Like you can if you're well versed in this kind of stuff, but to the average homeowner, it would be a tall ask to be able to make a strong apples to apples comparison when you're talking about different equipment, different brands, different size plumbing, different number of pipes, uh, different filter type, like there's all kinds of differences which make it hard to, like are these actually equal comparisons? Because when it comes down to the, the bottom line, the dollars and cents, yes, it's important to have a palatable number, a number that you can afford to spend, but not if you're getting a compromised product. Like you're spending this presumably as like a once in a lifetime thing to endeavor to have a swimming pool built. You want a good pool. You want something that you're going to be happy with in the long term. So when you're getting these estimates, really go out of your way to try to push the point 
and force the issue that you want to create an apples to apples comparison between these quotes. This means to whatever extent you can, you want comparable equipment between them. And if you're not sure, ask the dealer, is this comparable to this other specific brand maker model of equipment? Further to this, you need to make sure that the scope of work is the same. You know, if uh, one contractor gives you a quote for a vinyl pool and another contractor gives you a quote for a concrete pool, they're not really comparable. They're actually totally different things. If you want a vinyl pool, you need multiple quotes from vinyl pool builders and likewise for concrete pools or fiberglass pools. When it comes time to ask for references from any potential swimming pool builder that you're considering, here's a couple of tips that can help you get the job done a little bit better. You need to protect your interests because who knows who this person is that you're talking to. You would hope that they would be an upstanding person, but perhaps they're not. And you certainly don't want to lose any money over this. So you can't just get one reference and then just call them and the person's like, oh yeah, Bob the Builder, there's, they're the best, love them. What if that's Bob's cousin that you're talking to? I mean, that could happen. So here's how you go ahead and protect yourself. You have a type of pool that you're asking for here and you live in a certain area. So when I get references, I might say to the builder, please provide me with five local references for similar projects that you've completed recently. And what I want to see is that I'm going to contact two or th preferably three of these people randomly from the list of five. So right away, I'm stacking the deck against this person. I'm making it hard for them to pull the wool over my eyes. I'm making them give me a bunch of references. I get to choose which one that I'm gonna call. So hopefully I avoid calling his cousin or hopefully he doesn't have that many cousins. But here's more information I wanna know. How, how recent are these? Are all of these jobs like in the last one, two or three years? That's a good thing. If they're giving you references from like nine years ago, that might be okay. I might want to go and check out a pool that they built that's nine years old, but I want to see more recent references. I also want to see those references in my immediate vicinity. Don't give me a, you know, a reference for another state or another side of the country or somebody who lives six cities away because I'm asking myself, why can't you give me references for similar projects that you've built in my area? Like you're telling me you can build this pool that I'm asking for, but also you can't show me examples of the ones that you've done that are similar to what I'm requesting. That's not a good thing. That's a red flag for me. So I want references. I want them to be recent. I want them to be local. I want them to be similar to the project scope that I'm looking for here. What else do I want? I want this person to show up on time and I want the communication chain to be open and clear. It is shocking how often pool owners speak about the difficult process that they have communicating with their pool builder. Whether it be they're, they don't show up on time or they're behind schedule and not communicating, things aren't going well, you can end up in this situation where you're hesitant to speak to them about subjects because they're, they hastily brush you off or they seldom give you the answers you're looking for. Like These are realities of the pool installation process. I wish they weren't, but they were and you should be aware of it. What you can do about that is perhaps to try to establish right from the beginning is that you're a person which requires clear communication. Like you carry a supercomputer in your pocket. We all do. If we have an appointment for 2 p.m. and it's 2, 2.05, 2 2.10, you're not there. You haven't called. Like I, I hope nothing bad's happened, but like I'm expecting a car accident here because there's absolutely no reason. You can't just pick up the phone, give me a ring, let me know that you're behind schedule or something to that effect. Let's respect each other's time here and let's keep the communication chain open. When you're having a pool built, you are spending a stupendous amount of money. Maybe I am the unrealistic one when I say, I want clear and open communication and I don't want you to, I don't want to feel like you're doing me a favor talking to me about my pool that you're building in my yard with my money. So let's just go ahead and establish that up front. Are you speaking to a company that seems like they're going to be responsive to you when you have questions, especially when those questions start to deviate from the standard stuff like, how much is it? When can you start? Ask a technical question that requires like some actual thought consideration or research. See if they do it. See if they get back to you with a meaningful answer. That would establish to me that this is a company that's willing to go out of their way to communicate with me and make me comfortable with this process. Let's talk about the pool estimate itself for a second here. You are going to have sticker shock. That is basically the number one problem when you're a salesperson that they're selling swimming pools, half the people you give the price to just faint dead on the floor and when they wake up, they suddenly don't want a swimming pool anymore. So pools are expensive, they are a massive luxury. But even to that degree, 
it, it gets really crazy, especially if you come to the table with like a really extravagant plan, which I would say most pool or most homeowners building a pool tend to do. Building a pool is a big deal. You're probably not going to build 10 pools in your life. Maybe only this one. So you want a cool one. You want the one with the things you want, with some features and bells and whistles and all that stuff. And I totally appreciate it. I want that too. The problem is I'm not Scrooge McDuck. Maybe you're not either. And this stuff gets out of hand so fast. Like you're talking $100,000 maybe gets you a bare bones pool installation with absolutely no bells and whistles, no landscaping, hardscaping, stamped concrete decks, fancy equipment, none of that. Maybe not even the pool itself, depending on where you live and what kind of pool you're putting in. When you want the whole package, I want landscaping, I want some nice plants over here, a pretty Japanese maple grown over here, a patio, a gazebo, a pool, a cover, high-tech equipment, automation, all the stuff. It's like, okay, cool, like two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. Like that's what it's gonna cost. So I hope that's what you're ready to spend. And I think most people aren't. So when you come to the table with this, you know, with this desire, this want list for what you're gonna have for this swimming pool. I want you to know that you're gonna have the sticker shock up front. So right away, I want you thinking of this whole concept from, I want a good basic pool. You definitely don't want a bad pool. I'm sure you would agree with that. So start with what it takes to get a good basic pool. Now, let's look at the want list. What's kind of like the costs for these different wants that you want? And right away, here's how you define the difference between something that you wanna get right now and something that maybe you could get later because you're hemorrhaging money right now building a new swimming pool. And if there's something that is a bolt-on device, it's not like integrally built as part of this pool, you could totally just add it later at no you know, penalty. Well, take that off the plate right now. Why would you even consider adding that now? Add that in your three or five when you can free up some more budget to allocate towards things like a saltwater chlorinator or something else for your pool. Waterfalls are kind of a worst offender for me. I know that waterfalls are problematic. They're expensive, they leak a lot, they're bad for the pool chemistry, and pool owners tend to not use them. Like you think you're gonna use them, and maybe you do at first, but over the long term, the vast majority of waterfalls sit unused in total disrepair with stagnant, stinky water in them. And if you ever did turn them on, it just dumps all that bacteria into your pool, as well as a lot of minerals and calcium and things like that that are leaching out from these stone or concrete materials that you made this waterfall out of. So for the cost, considering how appreciable it is, I tell people to forget about the waterfall. If you can't, if you're of the opinion like, look, it's, I'm building this pool, I want, I want this waterfall, I respect where you're coming from, here's an option. What if we were to install some sauna tubes in the ground, which are vertical columns of concrete that use to support heavy structures. So we pick where the waterfall is going to go. We install the sauna tubes in the ground and we even run some extra plumbing and account for in the plumbing design for this system, we're going to have some availability of extra flow for a future water feature. So we put the sauna tubes in the ground now so we don't have to tear up the deck later to support a waterfall. We've already located the plumbing to the area. We also have that plumbing in the equipment area. So basically you're ready to go in a couple years time when you have some more money to spend. You're not having to redo any work necessarily, but you're also freeing up a lot more budget for the immediate concern, which is installing a good swimming pool. The frills, the be bells and whistles, they can wait to a later point. Here's something that happens all the time with swimming pool estimates. Like most of the time when somebody contacts me to help them review a swimming pool estimate, the estimate will include a one horsepower single speed pool pump for the filtration system. And you're like, yeah, what's, what's the problem here? The problem is, is it's not 1972. So the, first of all, the Department of Energy requires that you use a variable speed pump for a filtration pump for every swimming pool, bar none, every swimming pool. And the only exception to this are the existing swimming pools and selling of existing stock. And once that's done with, it's VS pumps only. So why would that be? Well, it could be a conspiracy from big energy just trying to screw you over, or it could be that they're way more energy efficient than the old counterpart's single speed pool pumps. The problem is, is they are more expensive to buy. I have a ton of videos which will show you why not only is it worth it to spend more money to get one, it'll actually pay for itself and then maybe even sometimes two or three times over paying for itself in full. So this is a great return on investment for you, but you gotta buy one to get the benefits. And here's the thing, 
The pool company knows when they give you a quote, half of you are going to faint dead from how expensive it is. So they go well out of their way to just like get that price chiseled down to the bare minimum price. They'll offer you the basic, most bare bone swimming pool package possible. But they didn't say that to you. They didn't say, hey, here is our most basic possible pool package. They just said, here's your price. And you looked at it and you're like, oh, that's not as bad. That's not as bad as that other guy who was charging me way more. That other person might have been building you a better pool. In fact, they probably were building you a better pool because there's always somebody out there willing to build a pool to 1972 standards. Even to this day, it shocks me how often I see that when a pool owner will contact me, they just had a pool built and they'll send me their specs and their, you know, of their plumbing system design and stuff. And it's, it's a disaster. I would have argued for a better system in 1972. And here we are, like, there's no reason to be designing systems with remarkable inefficiency built into them, which actually happens all the time. So what's a sign of this remarkable inefficiency being built into your swimming pool? Well, I'll give you a physical example so you can check something and see if this is happening to you. The suction line in a swimming pool or suction lines are very important. They're more important than the return lines or the pressure side of the system. So the number of suction lines you have and the size of those pipes are going to be critical to the efficiency potential of this swimming pool that you're having installed. And just to kind of summarize it, if you have inch and a half plumbing on the suction line of your swimming pool, stop. Okay, so inch and a half plumbing has a the maximum flow rate for efficient water flow, an inch and a half PVC pipe is only 38 gallons per minute. That's not very much at all. Like an inch and a half pipe can and will move more than 80 gallons per minute, even with a modestly, modestly sized pool pump. But only 35 gallons per minute, up to 35 gallons per minute is with maximum flow efficiency before we introduce a great deal of friction and turbulence from this high velocity water moving through the pipe. Not even to mention the fact that there's a safety consideration here as well in that suction lines should have no more than six feet per second of velocity for any suction line in any pool. And again, in an inch and a half pipe, that's only 38 gallons per minute. At least with a two inch pipe, that's 65 gallons per minute. And if you had two two inch suction lines, well, each one could provide 65 gallons per minute while remaining under six feet per second of water velocity, giving you a total flow potential of 130 gallons per, per minute while maintaining a very high degree of flow efficiency. Okay, now we're talking about a better system here, but unless you're building like a hot tub sized pool, I don't think you could make a, a, a strong argument for having inch and a half plumbing lines in a swimming pool built modernly. So that is something that you can actually check and it might not even say it, probably doesn't say it on your estimate. You probably have to go so far as to contact the company and start to pick at things apart and ask them technical questions about the way they're building the pool. They're kind of like right on a napkin, you know, like one pool, like this many gallons and it'll have a pump. Like that's pretty much all they're telling you. Don't accept that and dig into the, the meat and bones of it and ask them, well, what are you doing here? What's the, how many suction lines? How, what size are those suction lines are going to be? What material are you building the, the, the plumbing system with? Is it rigid PVC? Is that schedule 40 or schedule 80 that you're using? Or are you using flexible PVC? Well, I would definitely, definitely want to know that as part of my consideration process for any estimate I receive. And most people aren't writing, like we use flex PVC on the top of their estimate they, that they send to you. You really do have to take the onus of responsibility on your own shoulders, protect your own interests, become a technically minded person for this pool installation process so that you can become better informed, better prepared to make informed decisions and protect your own interests when you have this pool built. Let's talk about pool equipment for a second here. Remember I told you that whole sticker shock thing and they're going to go out of their way to give you like a palatable number. Well, because of that, the pool equipment that you get is probably going to be the most entry-level bare bone stuff that they can offer. Why would they go and offer you an extra $10,000 of equipment on the equipment pad, thereby making their quote look less appealing than, than the other guy's quote? And they don't necessarily know that you're going to appreciate all these differences that they've made in terms of like the system design. But I think further than that, what happens here is that there's a lot of companies out there that aren't necessarily on the, the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of technology for swimming pools. And so there actually could be a host of peripheral items you'd be incredibly interested in investing some money in. 
were it presented as an option to you, were it made available, something that you knew about, like for example, one of the latest things in swimming pools, something that's really brand new, like I've been in the industry 30 plus years and I have a keen interest in this kind of stuff, and I've never heard of an AOP system before a few years ago, advanced oxidation process, which is a hydroxyl radical generator. A hydroxyl radical generator utilizes unstable chemical elements, hydroxyl radicals, which are something that do exist, are, are plentiful in the lower Earth's atmosphere, and it's kind of the way that Mother Nature keeps our air clean and clear, but it is a very reactive uh, process such that it oxidizes, aggressively oxidizes impurities, in the same way things that like a ozone system might, or a germicidal UV lamp might, but up to one million times more effective, faster working than either of those options independently. And there are a couple different ways you can make hydroxyl radicals with an AOP generator, a couple of different technologies which support this. Some use uh, ozone mixed with germicidal UV in order to create the hydroxyl radicals. Some use a different technology like Clear Comfort is the name of an AOP system manufacturer which has developed their own pri proprietary method which doesn't have the, the ozone and UV system that a lot of other AOP manufacturers are using. And I mean, I don't wear a lab coat to work. So I mean, we reach a wall where I can tell you scientifically where one is better than the other. But if you're interested in really neat and cutting edge stuff for keeping water clean and clear, an AOP system might be for you, might be something you want to look into. And maybe you want to contact Clear Comfort and have a discussion with their, uh, their technical team and ask them about their product and why it might be beneficial for your water. Here's the thing, the average pool company probably is not capable of having this conversation with you. If I'm totally honest, the average swimming pool technician out there doesn't know what a hydroxyl radical generator is. They don't know what AOP is and they couldn't explain to you how it works. Would it be beneficial for you? Would it meet your expectations of function for this investment that you're going to make in this technology? They don't know. They don't know if it does or not. They just know that the higher the price goes, the less likely that they land the job. And so if they just build you a regular pool with a small sand filter and a single speed pump and you just use some chlorine, they know it works. They know that they'll not likely have any callbacks or complaints from you because they've been building pools like that for decades now. But it doesn't mean that it necessarily is best for you. Again, you have to kind of be proactive here as a homeowner these days when you're looking to have a pool installed. And you might have to specifically research the equipment that you're installing. Ozone, AOP, germicidal, uh, UV lights, salt chlorine. There's a bunch of options that you might want to consider. And just because the company who you asked to build this pool says, oh, I wouldn't get a UV lamp, forget it, they don't even work. Like, I'm pretty sure that UV lamps work. Where I live, if you have a high risk aquatic facility like a children's splash pad or a warm water therapy pool in a senior center, these are required to have additional protection over and above chlorine, specifically germicidal UV, UV lights. So, Either we're all crazy or maybe that salesperson you're talking to needs to bone up on their technology for swimming pool systems because there might actually be some pretty good options and I'll be honest with you, a lot of them, most of them are expensive options and it might not be something that you can afford right now but you want to be aware, you want to know what's out there because you know, people are more conscious these days of, you know, things like health and using minimal amounts of chemicals in their pool. And probably a lot of people listening to this, having a pool built modernly are of the opinion, no, like I definitely want, like I want a safe pool, but I want the least amount of chemical exposure. So what is the best method to get that? Probably not the method that's stipulated on that initial estimate you received. One more item on equipment here before I move on. Let's say they give you a small sand filter, 24 inch sand filter, 20 inch sand filter. To me, that's just a perfect example of somebody offering you the bare minimum that's gonna get the job done. And it has a very low price tag attached to it. So, I mean, yes, there is, there's a place for very economical entry level equipment and a sand filter certainly meets that requirements provided it's sized correctly to the volume of the swimming pool, that is, but there's better options. There pretty much actually every other option on the market is better than just a regular sil silica sand, sand filter. So, you know, some things are worth investing in. You could research a cartridge filter. You could research glass media for your sand filter instead of silica sand. There's some options out there. And again, they don't necessarily give you all of those options up front because they're trying to avoid intimidating you with these punishly expensive prices for this pool installation. Let's move on now and talk about what I like to call provisions and exclusions. 
And you have to be very careful when you're having a pool built. Not everybody gives very detailed quotes or holds your hand as they explain the process. Some people are kind of gruff and short and they don't really give you the communication that you need to know what's going on. So then you get into the project and you reach an impasse where they're like, okay, go ahead and get rid of the dirt. And you're like, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? And they say, well, I dug the pool for you and I piled like dump trucks full of dirt there on your lawn. Go ahead and get rid of it. And you're like, how am I supposed to get rid of it? And they don't care because it's not their job. That's your dirt. Where do you want it? And you think that sounds crazy, but it's not. So you just want to make sure things like, hey, so after you dig the pool, you're, you're going to take the dirt away too, right? Because I, I don't want to hear no that we're not, or no, we backfill the pool with the dirt that we dug with. I don't like either of those answers. I want, I want something that is more reliable for my backfill, and I definitely don't want to be left to deal with, you know, tons and tons of earth that you dug from digging my pool. What about stuff like the fence needs to come down, because they're going to have to get all this heavy equipment in there. Who's taking that fence down? And then once the project's completed, who's putting that fence back up? That's something that I definitely want to know. What about all of the, like, I mean, they're going to be wearing goat paths in your lawn from all the heavy equipment and wheelbarrows and workers and all this other stuff. So when the project is completed, are they going to restore your yard to like what it looked like before they got there? Or is that just your problem now? And they'll give you like the phone number for a landscaper who will sell you like resodding services or something like that. Both are options. Like really, you just have to ask. And I would not make the assumption that it's one versus the other, because again, this is something that comes up a lot of the times during pool builds. Things that you thought were covered weren't covered. And now that price starts getting up there. What about damages? Are there any provisions here in this contract for damage to your driveway, damage to an expensive Japanese maple that your wife has been growing for years? Or what about something happened to your neighbor's property as a result of the work that's going on in your property? There should be provisions for this kind of thing. You definitely don't want to figure this out on the fly when tempers are high, the neighbor's yelling, there's some sort of damage. You know, you want that all dealt with well in advance. And I mean, as much as you'd like a, uh, you know, a white glove service, hands off, they just take care of everything. Not every contractor offers that. So you want to be explicitly clear in the beginning before any ground gets broken on this project, the limitations of what they're gonna be doing and what they're not going to be doing on this project. Speaking of things they're gonna be doing on this project, let's talk about something. What happens if they go to dig your pool, they start digging, uh-oh, we found a giant rock buried right where your pool is gonna be. And you're like, yeah, so move the rock. And they're like, it's actually going to be like X many thousand dollars plus some delay time to deal with this problem of yours. And, and you're thinking, problem of mine? No, you said you're digging the pool. Go dig my pool. I don't care what's under there. And here's the thing. And this, I heard this explained to me once, and it's a great way to describe this. So you're thinking it's their job to build the pool. They have no way to know that there's a giant boulder buried right where your swimming pool is supposed to go. There's no reasonable expectation that they could know that. So they start to dig, and wouldn't you know it, there's a boulder, and we got to move it. It can't stay where it is. They tell you, you have to pay. This is your pool. This is your yard. This is your boulder. You have to pay. And they say, the homeowner says back, no, no, no. We have a contract that says you're digging the pool, so dig the pool. Here's how it's posed. So what if instead of a rock, that contractor dug up a hidden treasure? Yay, isn't that fantastic? They're rich now. I mean, you're not, because as you've said, this is their problem now. Anything that gets dug up with this pool is their problem, including the treasure that they dug up. At this point, homeowners start saying, well, no, that's my treasure. Well, here's the thing. It can't be your treasure, but their boulder. So it's got to be either or here. And really, when it comes down to it, it's yours. This is your house, your property, your pool, your boulder, and your problem paying the bill. Here's a question that I would ask any person who's going to build a swimming pool on my property. Will you maintain a proper safety fence throughout the entirety of the project? Because building a pool takes weeks or months, and so the fence is gonna be down and they're in and out. There's workers coming and going all the time. But you know what I don't like? I don't like an eight or 10 foot deep hole dug in the backyard and no fencing, no safety, no barriers, nothing at all. Any little person or animal could just amble into the backyard and fall in and get hurt. Absolutely no way that's happening at my house. 
But I also don't want to have to be out there policing your workers, making sure that they're putting up a fence. I want a stipulation right in the contract that that is your responsibility as the pool builder because I can't really be out there policing your guys. You have to establish a protocol of safety with your workers and make sure that you do things like put up barriers and safety fences as required by your local code throughout this project. Let's talk about the timeline for building a pool for a second here. So first of all, expect delays. It's going to happen. No matter what they tell you, when you can plan to be swimming, in the back of my mind, I would be thinking, we're probably not going to meet that. And you know what I definitely wouldn't do? I wouldn't build a pool planning a completion date, and then I have like a major party or event the following week or two weeks later even, and I'm counting on the pool to be ready for this. Don't do that. That's a huge mistake. There's so many delays involved with building. Some of them, the builder's fault. Some of them, not their fault. You get bad weather. If you get pouring driving rain for two weeks, you're not pouring concrete in the pouring driving rain. So now you're two weeks behind. So do yourself a favor and reduce the stress level by establishing a timeline for completion. But in the back of your mind, recognizing that there is a very real likelihood that this project's gonna go over in time. There's a lot of moving parts that have to come together for a swimming pool, and it's very easy to go over timeline. Speaking of timeline, here's an important point. I really want like a, a gold star next to this point if you're a homeowner looking to have a pool built. This happens to me all the time. The very first point I made in this video, the very first one is I said you need to get three estimates. So I deal with people all the time who contact me and say, I, you know, I, I got these estimates, but it's no good. They're, they're busy. They can't build my pool for, for two or three years. So obviously they're not a good option. So now I'm looking at like other people. So right away, I'm approaching this from a different perspective. When somebody says to me, I'm available right now. Why are you available right now? Why are you not busy? If you say to me, yeah, I'll build your pool. I can build exactly what you want. I can meet all of your stipulations and provide you with references, but I'm booking two to three years out from now. That to me is like cause for celebration. You found the right pool builder. You just failed to recognize that because you want to go swimming right now. And I totally appreciate that. There's something to be said about being diligent, looking around, finding other options. Maybe there's somebody who is also qualified, who has a more favorable timeline. But just because a builder is booked up to me is not a no. That's a major yes. That is an absolute, yeah, that person's good at what they do. Other people want them as well. And probably they say stuff to you like, I don't even advertise anymore. And I got people beating down the door. That's probably one of the best pool builders in your area. And it's counterintuitive. Most homeowners don't think like that. They think, I want to go swimming. We want to get it built this year, next year by the absolute latest. When they hear two years out, three years out, they take this builder off the table when I wouldn't do that. I would, one, see if there's anything I can do to push my schedule back. Or maybe I can come to the table with the builder and be like, I could pay 5% extra. Or what if I'm ready to go at the drop of a hat? What if you have a cancellation? I am ready to go. You call me with two days notice and we're building this pool. They might, they might be open to that. You know, as a, as a busy builder, it's nice to be able to, to stack your schedule, but you can't do it overly so where you're going to start disappointing your customers because one project gets delayed and then it just goes downstream and delays everybody. So you build your schedule full, but you don't overly stack it. Having a customer in the pocket with a signed contract and we know all the details and you're just waiting for an opportunity. And in a worst case scenario, the pool's going to get built in two to three years, but failing that, maybe you can get in there early. Maybe somebody cancels. Maybe somebody loses, if, they, if somebody loses their job, they're probably canceling the pool that they were going to have built. And if they've been booking two to three years out, well, who knows what, what's happening to the customer list that they have. They very realistically could have one person drop out from their confirmed people, lose their deposit or get it back. That's secondary, not your problem. But what's, what's your problem is that you want to go swimming as soon as possible, but you want a high quality pool, which means you want a busy pool builder. You don't want the guy who's just sitting around on his hands with nothing but time because nobody ever hires him to do anything. That's not the person I want to hire to build my swimming pool. Let's talk about warranty in relation to swimming pool installations. Remember, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a pool specialist. I've been in the industry for 30 years as a contractor and builder myself across the country, but I also know many people who are contractors and builders and probably numerous hundreds, maybe even thousands of pool companies at this point. Here's something I want you to know, and I want you to take this to heart. When you're having this pool built, there's a lot of moving parts. A lot of things are happening on the fly. 
and there's going to be changes. There's going to be things that come up. There's going to be that big boulder we discovered earlier, but there's also going to be other stuff. Like they're going to be forming your concrete walkway and they might say, oh, hey, we're just going to, we want to change the way we're forming this for whatever reason. I'm just giving this as an example. If that happens to you, you must get that in writing. If you do not get it in writing, where the contractor said, oh, we're going to add this, or we're going to, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll install an extra light. Oh, we're going to upgrade your pump to variable speed. Oh, we're going to run isolated plumbing lines. Oh, the, the deck is going to be this big or something like that. You need that in writing. And it's not that if this is an unscrupulous individual and they're going to screw you over because you didn't get it in writing. It could just be that they forgot. Pool builders are super busy. There's so much going on. Like I, I'd, be, I'd be lying if I said I haven't forgotten important details for stuff that I'm doing before, which if I didn't keep track of it in writing, then it would have been a problem. So if you're a homeowner and you're having a pool built, any time there's anything that changes after the contract is signed, you're standing in the backyard, or you're having a phone call or email and something is changing on the contract, do not take a verbal confirmation for that and then just have that issue be closed. Like have the conversation, take it verbally, and then say, go ahead and please email me these details and we can both sign off on this such that there's a paper trail here because once the project's done, it's weeks or months later, the person who does the billing and invoicing might not even be the same person who's in the backyard. So lines get, get crossed, there's things get, that can get confused and just little small changes like that could add up to be literally thousands of dollars difference in the amounts that you're being asked, asked to pay at the end of the project here. So keep everything in writing. If it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Before you choose a person to build your pool, here's something that I would want you to know. Pool equipment manufacturers, and so this would be like Jandy or Fluidra, Pentair, Hayward, these kinds of names. These manufacturers pretty much all have two lines of products. They have open line products, and then they have dealer protected products. So open line products are stuff that you can buy anywhere, like online, for example, maybe order it from Amazon and they have a limited scope and a limited offering for these products. They're very bare bones in terms of price, but they're also bare bones in terms of the offerings uh, that the equipment has and the warranty that you're going to receive if you buy them. That same equipment, almost exactly the same, but purchased from a dealer instead of say an online retailer, will probably get you two, three, more times as much warranty. So you might only get three months or no warranty at all from an online purchase of an expensive piece of pool equipment. And that same piece, had you purchased it from a dealer, could be three years or more dealer protected warranty simply because you purchased it from a dealer as opposed to an open line. So when you're having this pool built, I wouldn't just make the assumption, well, it's a pool builder, so obviously they're gonna sell me, you know, pool dealer equipment, I would not make that assumption. I would go out of my way to stipulate that your pool dealer, I want the dealer protected equipment brands and I want it in writing what my warranty is for each piece of equipment that they're going to be installing for you. Let's talk about swimming pool safety for a second. You're having a new pool built. The assumption would probably be, obviously my pool is going to be safe. They're not going to build me anything which is unsafe, right? Well, I would love to say that the answer is that they wouldn't build you anything that's unsafe. And I would be lying because I see examples all the time where under experienced or under skilled pool builders will install something which I can simply only describe as dangerous. There are established standards for safety. You don't have to invent your own standards for how to build a safe swimming pool. And that's a great thing. A great resource for any pool builder or homeowner having a pool built would be the Virginia Graham Baker Act. The Virginia Graham Baker Act stipulates safety provisions for anti-entrapment in swimming pools. And there are a lot of them, way more than I could possibly list for you here. But now that you know about this document, you can have a conversation with your pool builder about this. I'm going to give you a specific example, probably my worst offender for things that I see that are wrong, that are not supposed to be like this. So the VGBA stipulates that no suction line in a swimming pool should have more than six feet per second of water velocity, no suction line. So we're going to take a pretend example pool here that has one skimmer 
one inch and a half plumbing line, nothing else. That's all it's got. Small pool, basic pool. And here's the thing. So that pool should, by the VGBA standard, only have 38 gallons per minute of flow through that inch and a half suction line because that's six feet per second of water velocity. So here's the thing. Most pool pumps on the market are very large and very powerful. And even a modest one is probably going to try to drive upwards of 80 or more gallons per minute through this, this pipe. And this is especially true if it's a single speed pump because there's no ability to turn down the speed. It only has like pedal to the metal. That's its only speed. So if you're pumping 80 gallons per minute through a suction line that is only rated for a safe limit of 38 gallons per minute, well then I guess technically speaking, the pool's not safe. Now it doesn't mean it's gonna explode and every swimmer that goes swimming in it's gonna die. It's not like that. It's just about, you, you don't wanna play the odds on being safe when you're swimming or like, let's be realistic here. Pools are for children. The children are the ones that are in the pool. It's not yourself as much like, I, I'm not worried about an entrapment hazard with my hair. It is a physical impossibility because I'm as bald as a cue ball. But you know, little kids, long hair swimming around, and the thing is, is the kids don't know any better. They horse around and do inherently dangerous stuff that they don't think about. And so as a result, it's not good enough to have a pool that may or may not be safe. Build a safe swimming pool. And if you are a professional installing swimming pools, I sure hope that you would endeavor to learn how to install one safely. And it disappoints me tremendously to say that that is not always the case. And as a homeowner, you need to protect your own interests here. You need to learn about the Virginia Graham Baker Act and stipulations for safety for things like anti-entrapment and submerged suction outlets and swimming pools. And there's a bunch of different provisions. And I wanna know for a fact that the person building my pool knows about all these stipulations, deals with them regularly, and will of course be following all of them when they build me my swimming pool. Okay, so the last thing I, I wanna mention to you here, you're gonna get a pool built, you did everything else I said here, good for you, I hope you have a great process. And then at some point you're expecting the handoff the handover of the pool, pool school, you know, as the salesperson told you. And you're expecting this, you know, you're expecting the, them to show up with a bottle of champagne, you celebrate together and you spend the day getting to learn the pool and all this. That literally never happens. Most of the time when they hand over the pool to you, which means they filled it up, we started the pump, it's yours now. And really what they're saying is they just like give us the final amount that you owe because we're done here. The whole process where they educate you on how to use your equipment and how to manage your swimming pool, what each of the things does and how to interact with them, it's so minimally inadequate. And I guess maybe just knowing that going in, you could maybe specifically request a very thorough pool school or something to that degree. But in all reality, you'll probably have to spend a good amount of time and effort on your own investigating the equipment that you have, the proper way to operate it, how to chemically manage your water, how to do water testing, the order of operations. There's a ton of stuff that you're gonna need to know as a new swimming pool owner. And I hope that this video that I made here was helpful to you planning on getting a swimming pool once you get a swimming pool, I hope you'll give me the benefit of the doubt. Come back to swimmingpoolsteve.com. Continue to learn from me about your swimming pool. I have a ton, a literal ton of great resources and videos to help you learn to care for, maintain, operate your pool, your water, your equipment, all of that. If you found this information helpful, please be sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you can check out my website, swimmingpoolsteve.com.